Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Istanbul Planning Agency's talks on Istanbul. Uh, we are very excited today uh, to have Professor Joseph Heathcott as our guest speaker. Uh, before we start, uh, I want to introduce myself briefly. Uh, my name is Bushra and I'm an environmental engineer uh, at Vision 2050 office. I work uh, as an expert researcher on the topic of uh, climate crisis, ecology and environmental policies. And I would like to give uh, brief information about Istanbul Planning Agency now. Uh, the Istanbul Planning Agency was announced in February 2020 uh, to plan a better future for Istanbul uh, together with the participation of 16 million residents of Istanbul. Uh, Vision 2050 office is one of the four offices uh, within the Istanbul Planning Agency and our office uh, focuses on developing ways uh, to, make, to make the future for this ancient city uh, fairer, greener and more creative. Uh, as such, the Vision 2050 office aims to form uh, the building blocks of Istanbul's future uh, through an inclusive, uh, comprehensive and multidimensional approach. Uh, we are waiting for your questions on the YouTube channel and now I'm leaving the microphone to my friend Mine. Thank you, Bishra. Thank you very much for everyone uh, for being with us tonight. My name is Mine. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in politics at the New School for Social Research, writing my um, dissertation on the histories of dogs and um, the lively infrastructures of care and violence uh, encompassing their lives in the city and at the Istanbul Planning Agency 2050 office, I work with Bushra as a researcher on the climate change, ecology and environmental politics tonight. We are very excited and having the rare pleasure of uh, having with us one of the most empowering and um, thought provoking scholars of contemporary urban studies, uh, who has also been my teacher, my mentor, co-advisor in my doctoral research, Joseph Heathcote is with us tonight. And I would like to very briefly introduce Joseph's like large portfolio of work and uh, like um, his wide range of research. Uh, Joseph is the Associate Professor of Urban Studies and Design at the New School, where he also teaches in Milano School for Urban Policy and Parsons School of Design. He has served for years as Chair of Urban Studies, Faculty Director of Civic Engagement and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs du during 2010 and 12 academic year. He was the U.S. Fulbright Distinguished Chair of the for the United Kingdom at the University of Arts in London and senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics in 2016 and 17. He held the Mellon uh, Distinguished Fellowship in Architecture and Urbanism at Princeton University. Most recently, he was a visiting scholar in Eco Urban at Sciences Po in Paris and Professor Heathcote. Um, scholarly and teaching interests include but uh, are never limited to cities real and imagined, the history and the theory of architecture and planning, urban, urban civic and public culture, and cities as living archives of creativity, urbanity, and design. His essays, photographs, maps, and drawing have appeared in wide range of venues, including books, journal, magazines, exhibits, uh, jury at art show. He has curated several exhibits in venues such as Town Hall Gallery in Stuttgart, Germany, MIT Galleries, and the Sheldon Gal Galleries in St. Louis, and the Queens Museum in New York. From 2012, um, uh, 2013, sorry, 2015, Joseph was the president of the Society for the American City and Regional Planning History and currently serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, uh, the Journal of the Academic Planning Association and the Planning Perspectives. Perspectives. I consider myself very lucky for having had the opportunity to, do, to work with him as well as part of my doctoral research and being his teaching assistant for the legendary dynamic metro, metropolis classes he taught at the new school. 
Besides all of these, Joseph is also a photographer, a flaneur, an artist, and a prolific writer and inspiring interlocutor of many uh, urban theorists of our time. He's the author of many books, articles, photographic essays, and as well as a generous contributor to all of these fields. He writes extensively about and teaches about and uh, teaches us about uh, vernacular architecture, the live uh, experiences in the city, heritage of racial capitalism, new urban form, assemblages of aesthetics and possibilities of democracy, living together and social justice in the city. Tonight, Joseph will share with us his long-term project using photographic and ethnographic methods. He will walk us through the streets uh, of two neighborhoods and uh, these two Jackson Heights in New York City and Belleville in Paris. And uh, he will walk us through these two vibrant, highly diverse, disturbed, resisting, transforming and beautiful streets. We'll be, and we will hopefully discuss, discuss why these streets uh, what these trees tell us about the possibilities of living together in a rapidly changing complex cities of our time. Joseph, thank you so much for being with, with us tonight. And we are very happy uh, to have you here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And I, um, I give you the floor. Fantastic. Uh, so I shall share my screen now. Please do, yeah. <clears throat> share. And then we will go, how's that? Is that okay? Perfect, yeah. You can, okay, wonderful. Uh, well, I, I hope that I can live up to that introduction. Uh, it, it, it sort of sounds like you introduce someone who doesn't have, uh, doesn't have ability to focus very much, <laughs> but I will try in this talk to focus as much as I can. Uh, and um, I apologize in advance for uh, not being able to speak Turkish. I wish I could, it's a beautiful language, um, but uh, my language skills are limited to French and English and Spanish. So hopefully uh, the English will be okay. Uh, it is a very real honor to be present uh, with all of you today and to contribute uh, to the lecture series of this extraordinary Institute for Urban Research. And I am immensely grateful to Mina Yildirim and Bushra Bingol for the generous invitation to present uh, my work in such a prestigious venue as this. Um, I owe a particular debt of gratitude to Mine, who is not only an incredible uh, and, uh, and generous colleague and friend, but uh, who's an inspiring intellectual uh, as well, uh, someone whose work falls uh, really on that effervescent and highly generative boundary uh, between research and practice, a, a kind of borderland that I try to inhabit myself, though with considerably less grace and skill. Uh, and I only wish that I could actually be there with all of you uh, in Istanbul and that after the talk, we could wander through those great and storied streets together, uh, maybe see the falling snow as I, I hear there is. Um, but this pandemic, uh, this global tragedy has reshaped uh, much of our social life and our public and private expectations. And so we must content ourselves uh, with this virtual space of flows. So um, as Mine said, while my talk today is not about Istanbul per se, uh, it is highly relevant uh, for your city and for all cities uh, and really for our planetary future, uh, I would argue. And my, um, let me see, hold on, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get my, uh, keep going here, sorry. Okay. So my talk today is motiv motivated by and touches directly upon urgent matters of politics in an age of Trumpism and Brexit. For while Trump himself is finally exiting the White House and it couldn't come soon enough, this legacy of uh, belligerence and anti-immigrant hostility and white racial revanchism lives on in the constituency that he cultivated the same constituency that recently stormed the Capitol in a dangerous but ultimately failed attempt uh, to overturn the election results and reinstall Trump uh, as their leader. And while Brexit looms uh, as a done deal, um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm having a little trouble with it. There, there, <laughs> that's the image I wanted to start with. Uh, and while Brexit looms as a done deal, 
uh, the xenophobic forces that pry to open that fissure between the uh, the island of of the United the islands of the United Kingdom and the continent continue to threaten the very project of Europe with dissolution. And so amid these revanchist politics, I want to offer a contrary plea uh, for a politics grounded in diversity, plural societies, uh, an expansive no notion of citizenship and the pos possibility of a cosmopolitan vision. Uh, and I wanna ruminate on these themes through a documentary photo photographic project that I've been working on uh, for a few years. Sorry. Um, so over the past few decades, planetary migration streams loosed by economic deprivation, regional wars, and globalization have catapulted questions about diversity and tolerance to the forefront of political debate. In the US, the wave of xenophobic uh, hostility that emerged after 9-11 and that culminated in the election of Trump to the presidency reflects a deep moral panic. Uh, over the meaning of citizenship and the boundaries of culture and belonging in a rapidly changing world. Uh, police continue to murder black men and women with impunity, uh, confident in their juridical primacy. Uh, Pro-Trump marches slide effortlessly into attacks on immigrants uh, and the blurring and or the burning of black churches. Hate crimes have increased across the United States perpetrated against Jewish, Muslim, Latino, and Black people as a kind of hyperventilation of the white Christian body politic challenged for the first time in history with a loss of its primacy. In this sense, the near frantic obsession among Trump supporters to finish the wall, to build the wall, is less a practical solution to the flow of undocumented people than it is a symbol of white racial revanchism. The delirious demand to build a massive barrier along the US-Mexico border to round up undocumented people and hold them in detention centers conjures a, a hallucinatory enemies whose very presence seems to threaten the racial order. Meanwhile, terrorist attacks by so-called Islamists in Paris, Berlin, London, Madrid, and Istanbul not only result in deaths, but in unsettled nerves and profound social disease as people adjust to conditions of fear and distrust. In Israel, the disenfranchisement of dark-skinned others, the expansion of the settler colonial state, and the destruction of homes and livelihoods of Palestinian people reinforce conditions of violence and oppression in the region. And the growing refugee crisis across the Middle East and Europe unleashed yet more waves of xenophobic hostility, shaping the outcomes of elections in Germany, France, Austria, Hungary, and the Netherlands, each turning crucially on questions of multiculturalism, immigration, and citizenship. While mutually reinforcing this continual dance between incendiary violence and reactionary politics has provoked widespread soul searching about the role of tolerance in nominally democratic societies, or for that matter, in authoritarian regimes and settler colonial states. As these dark clouds roll over our world, we must ask ourselves a very basic question. How will we live with each other in the 21st century? What human modes of togetherness are possible in what seems to be an increasingly liberal political landscape? With over half of the world's population now residing in urbanized areas, and with the limitations of nation states as a secure, stable framework for diverse social relations, the answer to this question, I would argue, lies to a large extent in our great cities. It is there amid the bustling streets and sidewalks, shops, markets, parks, and playgrounds that large numbers of people encounter one another across lines of difference. And it is out of these, the multiplication of such encounters, we might hope, that new social forms arise to reshape the terms of life uh, in an increasingly global age. So my project, which is tentatively titled Laboratories of the Next City, examines these manifold spaces of encounter and the people who inhabit and shape them in the context of urban neighborhoods remade by immigration over the last century. Neighborhoods like the Barrio Alto uh, in Lisbon, which you see here. 
while drawing uh, extensively uh, on demographic data and life course narratives, the project makes primary use of documentary photographic methods to bring emergent spatial realities of the city into relief. The central focus of the project is the search for the cosmopolis, or perhaps more accurately, the possibilities for cosmopolis. And here I'm using the term cosmopolis to signal an urban condition uh, or way of life that arcs towards tolerance uh, and that derives social benefits from elevated degrees of human diversity. However, this is not the abstract tolerance of Locke or Rousseau, ennobled in philosophy and codified in law, though these may be important to the story nor is it the bland, bloodless multiculturalism beloved of 1990s educational textbooks and corporate rhetoric. Rather, it's the rough and the multi-textured, always incomplete tolerance achieved through constant negotiation between diverse groups in the ordinary course of social relations. What scholars such as uh, Fuyuki Kurosawa and Ajun Aparai have called a cosmopolitanism from below. It is a search for meaning in what urbanist Abdul Malik Simon describes as the intricate details of people's everyday lives. And not just one meaning, but an assemblage of them, an assemblage of meanings, multiple trajectories of traveling and inhabiting and relating to one another across lines of difference. After all, as literary theorist Ursula Heise put it, we're not talking simply about whole intact selves located in internally coherent places, but rather about fragments and assemblages, performative and relational connections forged in the breach, hearts that beat in multiple places. For if the precondition of building a new world is transnational solidarity, then the precondition of transnational solidarity is precisely the cosmopolitanism from below, forged in the fugitive folds and spaces of great cities. A next city, always present, a next city researched and developed by immigrants and working class people in the ordinary practice of getting by. And so in neighborhoods and communities around the world, this next city wells up as an unfinished proposition an urban world continually in the making, weaving together the threads of human diversity, changing landscapes, multiform aspirations, ordinary people remake the city through daily interactions and adaptations, both to their new conditions and to one another. Sometimes these adaptations arise out of the vernacular of custom and habits of the heart, other times from the swirl of people in motion and the rush of new ideas, avatars, and possibilities of being in a digitally driven, fiber optically connected world. And indeed, here we are. Occasionally, groups coalesce into more determined collectivities, such as immigrant rights groups, nonprofit organizations, refugee resettlement agencies, political clubs, business networks, and other institutions of civil society. In all cases, such efforts reflect the intense work undertaken by people to create functional and pleasurable and meaningful places and ultimately to change the sense of the city itself to include them, to include their presence. These days, of course, much of the attention among architects, planners, urban designers, and scholars of the globalization, uh, with whom I spend a great deal of time, uh, much of their attention is focused on the talismans of globalization and cosmopolitanism, a scripted indexical suite of grand projects. We are captivated, indeed mesmerized by the spectacular futurist propositions of Mazdar City, the mushrooming towers of Shenzhen, the worlding power of the Al London Olympics, the post-human promise of hyper-smart Songdo in Korea. And why not? These, they are designed to capture our attention, to dumbfound us with their futurity. Such developments are tied together not only through global financial performance requirements, but through the adventures of a diverse, jet-setting, early adopting high-tech elite. The footloose stratum uh, of designers and consultants and sales reps and software engineers and brand managers, apostles of the creative class crisscrossing the planet, selling the sizzle of globalization and global identity. 
Indeed, as an ensemble and perpetual, perpetual motion, they underscored the cliche of cosmopolitanism as the province of a canny cultural elite, the airportariat, the Ritzwazie, the limousine lumpen. And yet, I would submit that it is in the archipelago of diverse urban neighborhoods wedged into our great cities, forged through other mobilities that comprise the nucleus of an emergent cosmopolis. Such neighborhoods provide the space for, indeed the very possibility of negotiation, multilateral conflict and contingent resolution. In these tense interstitial nodes between older and emerging urban forms, ordinary people experiment, take risks and imagine possibilities for the future. It is in these rolling, these roiling locales that new social contracts take shape, new con concepts of citizenship, belonging, and belonging obtain. New values of coexistence uh, come into view, and really, such processes, uh, I have to say, are not without structural and personal violence. This isn't to downplay the person, the structural and personal violence at work in the world. Sometimes, barely contained, uh, ethnic and religious conflicts erupt into riots or even civil war. Uh, Beirut in the 1980s, Bujumbura uh, in the 1990s, Mosul in the 2000s, Aleppo uh, today. Even in the best of times, diversity itself is not an unalloyed good. It often reflects countless trajectories of pain and trauma, people forced to leave home for political or economic reasons, washed up on strange shores, desperate to find a foothold in new lands. To an outsider, the urban neighborhoods transformed by these flows might appear like the pleasurable symphony of human social multiplicity playing out in the daily ballet of the street. But to a resident, such diversity might feel like the incidental outcome of a heartbreaking sojourn to new lands, the subsequent competition for cheap housing and the endless hustle to make a living. It might reflect affordable business opportunities in marginal locations or the hunger for religious home place and kinship networks. The question must always be asked, if diversity is a social good, then for whom? How are these diverse cultural groups arrayed socially, economically, and politically? How equal are they in terms of rights and resources? What wages does, does diversity pay into the pockets of those inscribed with the lineaments of difference? Still, diverse urban neighborhoods play a mitigating role by enabling various groups to build safe havens from which to stake claims on the city. While global financial and political institutions shape the broad contours of urbanism, the central experience on the level of the street is the shifting cast of characters wrought through diasporic flows. Amid the everyday cacophony of city life, immigrant communities negotiate new urban conditions, carve out felicitous social and religious spaces, and establish resonant institutions to advance their interests. They adapt existing built environments and alter the uses of particular spaces to suit their needs. They are constantly compelled to work through conflicts, not only with each other, but also with the dominant culture and political apparatus of the host nation. In the process of girding their everyday lives and building collectivities, these groups offer crucial lessons for the future of the city, for getting along in a globalizing age. The result, as I've said, is an emerging cosmopolis, not a brittle doctrine imposed from above, but an open, flexible, agonistic, and ever-changing set of relations that blur social boundaries and that call forth new modes of togetherness. So the project that I've been engaged in these past few years examines such relations as I've been talking about in hyperdiverse or superdiverse neighborhoods in several countries. And this term hyperdiverse or sometimes superdiverse, um, what it indicates is a social and spatial condition where multiple ethnic, national or linguistic groups cohabitate, but where none dominate as a numerical majority. It's a condition of plural potentialities often braided together despite the hostilities and inequalities proffered by uh, the host society. And the neighborhoods that uh, so far in my study uh, include uh, Saint-Gilles 
uh, in Brussels, which you see here, this wonderful uh, image of uh, the um, city council elections uh, from 2016, um, Markham uh, and Scarborough in Toronto, San Telmo in Buenos Aires, Jackson Heights and Elmhurst in New York, and Belleville and Goudor in Paris. And additionally, I would really like to add Brickfields uh, in Kuala Lumpur to the mix. Uh, Brickfields is one of the greatest, has one of the greatest ranges of religious institutions in the world, uh, from Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist temples to Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant churches, as well as numerous mosques, uh, shrines, and ashrams. Finally, uh, it would be wonderful uh, to add Istanbul uh, to the mix. And I would love to hear uh, from people about this and, and why not? Uh, after all, right, there are a few cities on earth, uh, at least historically, uh, that better embody the notion of cosmopolitanism uh, than Istanbul, the erstwhile beating heart of the unimaginably diverse Ottoman Empire. What would it look like to add Istanbul to the mix? What neighborhoods might reveal the kind of research and development of this cosmopolis? Uh, the laborious forging of social relations across uh, lines of difference to build this next city. Where would you look? Would you start in the old city uh, in uh, Sultan Ahmed, uh, as you see here, uh, in Fati, Yanakape, uh, Tivali, Fenerbalat? Uh, would you look to Beolu, uh, to neighborhoods like Siangar and uh, Besiktas and Goltep? Uh, or would you have to go to the Asian side? Um, uh, for this, to Osmania, to Ushkurur, to uh, Kuzgungchuk, uh, to the various uh, neighborhoods there. Uh, now, of course, I'm mindful um, of the pitfalls of Ottoman nostalgia uh, and the complex history of Turkish nationalism as an identity project. Uh, but still, since I have the best possible audience here uh, to ask this question, uh, I, I'd be happy to hear uh, your thoughts about it uh, in the question period. Okay. Before we take a more detailed look at some of the neighborhoods, uh, I just want to quickly discuss uh, matters of photography itself. And the mode of image making um, that I'm presenting here uh, really emerges out of the tradition of documentary photography. Uh, but like many contemporary practitioners, I'm troubled by the conventions, the tropes, uh, and the traditional uses of the image, rooted as they are in a clutch of humanist, humanist epistemological conceits, uh, such as the notion of photography as a truth-telling device. Documentary photography, of course, has a long-standing relationship with urban social research. Progressive era reformers in the 19th and early 20th century, such as Jacob Rees, Lewis Hine, and Alice Seeley Harris, used photographs to depict social ills of tenements, factories, and colonialism, respectively. They inspired a generation of sociologists, and urban planners, and activists to deploy photography as a, as a tool for social reform. In the 1930s, uh, the US government hired leading photographers to document the impact of the Great Depression, uh, as you see here in these images, and the efforts of federal agencies to ameliorate the plight and suffering of people across the country. And so they sent uh, into the field uh, remarkable uh, talent, such as Dorothea Lang, whose notebooks and uh, uh, photograph you see here, uh, Walker Evans, Russell Lee, Marion Post Walcott, and so many others. And perhaps the apogee of classical documentary photography itself, uh, used in social research, at least in the US, came with the 1945 publication of The Black Metropolis by St. Clair Drake and Horace Caton. Uh, beginning in the 1960s, however, critiques of documentary photography arose from both theorists and photographers. Many were influenced by the photographer Robert Frank, uh, whose 1959 book, The Americas, uh, shows mundane, claustrophobically composed personal scenes, uh, greatly redacting the narrative scope and documentary license of the photograph. Similarly, in uh, the UK, the work of Paul Trevor and the Exit Photography Group in the 60s and 70s explored photography's affective capacities rooted not so much in intact subjects, uh, but in partial obscurances, bodily stances, kinesthetic gestures, and other fragmentary elements. And the work of the great street photographers, such as Vivian Meyer, 
Gordon Parks and Ara Guler, whose work you see here, revealed how the, how the image can simultaneously evoke and foreclose ready-made narratives, acting at once as visual prosthesis of collective memory and at the same time as instigators of stories unheralded and untold. Meanwhile, theorists such as Alan Sekula and Susan Sontag began to unravel the status of photography's truth claims, seeing instead a medium intersected and shaped by multiple discourses. Artists such as Martha Rossler uh, and Gary Winogrand, whose images you see here, uh, began to use the photograph as a way to destabilize the relationship between the, uh, the photograph itself and the subject, questioning the very possibility of the medium as a truth-telling device. Fortunately, since the 1980s, an emerging body of work by photographers has carved out space for more theoretically informed documentary practice. And here we see an image from Kevin Lee, a Korean photographer whose extraordinary Bay of Dreams series explores globalization in Singapore as a kind of fugue state induced through architectural forms and consumer imaginaries. This recent generation uses the exposure not to define social realities, but rather to explore contingent relations, liminal spaces, shifting identities, and alternate meanings. So rather than the classical humanist approach that assumes photography to be a transparent instrument of truth telling or a mode of access to depth and interiority, contemporary documentary photography uh, seeks meaning in the unstable relations between the photographer, the subject, the image, and the viewer. It's an effort to address what the great media theorist Ariella Azule has called the civil contract of photography. Thus in my own work, I use images not to define social realities, but rather to query them, to explore contingent relations, liminal spaces, shifting identities, and alternate meanings. So if this is the case, what have I learned by walking uh, in these various neighborhoods I've talked about, talking with residents and making images? Since there isn't time in this talk to review all of the communities where I have spent time, I'll say a little bit about uh, a few in particular and hopefully uh, draw a few tentative conclusions. So the first two neighborhoods in this tour are located in the New York City borough of Queens and include Jackson Heights, which is pictured here, and Elmhurst. For me, this is, uh, this is the part of the project that's closest to home, uh, and in fact, literally is home. In fact, I live in Jackson Heights, and I've lived here uh, for 14 years uh, and, and quite adore uh, this community. Um, ironically, though, uh, and very interestingly, Jackson Heights was originally planned as an outpost for white class, uh, white middle class Anglo Protestant families looking to escape the noisy, danger laden alien landscape of Manhattan. The Queensboro Corporation, which developed the neighborhood, even supplied a Protestant church and limited most apartments to two bedrooms, thinking that Protestant, Protestants have smaller families than Catholics and Jews, right? Uh, so, um, however, the vagaries of the Great Depression put a quick end to this racialized settlement geography. Uh, that's simply because they had to rent to whoever could uh, come and whoever could afford it. Uh, and so the neighborhood rapidly became home to a diverse array of second generation immigrant families, including Jewish, Polish, Greek, Russian, Cuban, and Irish families, uh, some of whom still remain in the neighborhood. Then with the passage of the 1965 Immigration Reform Act in the US, new waves of immigrants began moving into Jackson Heights and other parts of Queens drawn by cheap rents uh, and uh, the, the cheap rents that were available and the commercial opportunities. These newcomers eventually made Jackson Heights and surrounding neighborhoods the most ethnic, ethnically diverse place in the United States. And to get, uh, today, long settled uh, populations of South Asian families operate businesses in the blocks near the train station, dominated primarily by Bengali merchants from both India and Bangladesh, as well as from Gujarat and Kashmir. Meanwhile, immigrants from Colombia and Ecuador began settling the neighborhood uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, joined later by other Central and South American families from Guatemala, Peru, Uruguay, and Argentina, 
So Jackson Heights very quickly became the center of the Latino uh, LGBT community in New York City with a variety of clubs and drag bars lining Roosevelt Avenue. Most recently, a large wave of newcomers has entered the community from Nepal and Tibet. Um, this is a classic story uh, of the pa uh, of migration and immigration of the past half century with the first wave uh, composed of men seeking jobs and economic economic opportunities. Then once they're able to save enough money, uh, they bring wives, children, siblings and other relatives. This uh, this image is of a, of a, of a plaza that's uh, about three or four blocks from my apartment. Nepalese and Tibetan immigrants uh, are currently passing through the same segmented labor market as their predecessors from India and Central America, working primarily as day laborers, dishwashers, cooks, and delivery drivers. Some have managed to launch their own businesses as, as street vendors or shopkeepers, while others have taken jobs uh, with the city as street cleaners and parking wardens. Through these varied roles, newcomers encounter longer term residents as both conduct their business in the diverse streets uh, and shops of this neighborhood. They also encounter one another in the streets, the sidewalks, the playgrounds, the schools and the libraries, English language classrooms and public spaces of the neighborhood. And of course, in the ubiquitous flea markets, which uh, you see an example of here. Meanwhile, uh, just to the south of Roosevelt Avenue is the dividing line between Jackson Heights and Elmhurst uh, is this other super diverse neighbor at Elmhurst, uh, but with a slightly different mix of people. Like Jackson Heights, Elmhurst grew rapidly in the early 20th century with the extension of the elevated seven train along Roosevelt Avenue. Once home to a largely Irish American and Greek population, Elmhurst underwent a dramatic transformation in the 1970s and 1980s, a transformation similar to that of Jackson Heights with the influx of people from the Indian subcontinent and Central America, as well as from the Dominican Republic. However, since the 1980s, Elmhurst has also had a growing population of families from Hong Kong, Thailand, Vietnam, Vietnam Indonesia, and the Philippines. Most of these families cluster in the blocks uh, between Broadway Avenue and Queens Boulevard, uh, forming a pan-Asian community with groceries, restaurants, shops, and civic associations. And in fact, the monthly Indonesian food festival at St. James Episcopal Church has become an important venue for bringing families together across these multiple lines of difference. Most of these, um, oh, I'm sorry, and while sharing food is certainly one, uh, one way of weaving cross-cultural associations, another important effect has been the rise of immigrant solidarity in the face of government violence. In Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, for example, as soon as agents from immigration control and enforcement appear in the neighborhood or in the vicinity to make arrests on the street, multiple alerts go out across various online platforms and through the chain of word of mouth on the streets uh, to warn people to avoid particular areas uh, and places so as to escape the net of federal authority. The second group of neighborhoods that I want to visit uh, here includes uh, Belleville and the Goutte d'Or in Paris. Uh, Belleville is a faubourg on the right bank of Paris located to the east of the city's historic center, straddling four arrondissements, four quarters of the city. It enjoyed status as an autonomous commune until it was incorporated into Paris uh, into the middle of the 19th century. And Belleville is traditionally a working class neighborhood um, it, was, uh, it also attracted refugees from the abortive 1848 revolution in Germany, as well as Jewish immigrants from the shtetls of Russia and Poland. Its cabarets and bookstores attracted Bohemians, radicals, anti-clerical Catholics, and transients. Think Edith Piaf when you think uh, of, of uh, Belleville. Dissidents from Belleville have played important roles in both the 1848 uprising uh, in, and, and the Paris Commune of 1871. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the neighborhood increasingly attracted immigrants from Armenia, Lebanon, and Cyprus, particularly uh, after the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. 
After relative stability through decades of economic depression and war, the neighborhood began to change again in the 1950s as migrants began to move from Algeria, Morocco, Vietnam, and other French, uh, French or former French colonies. Most of the Vietnamese, uh, in fact, were actually ethnic Chinese uh, and Francophone Catholics worried for their futures after the fall of French forces at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Meanwhile, the harsh and violent treatment of North African migrants in France touched the lives of many residents of Belleville in the 1950s and 1960s. Finally, over the last few decades, new streams of migration have opened up from West Africa. While most Sierra Leoneans and Cameroonians made their way over to the Goutte d'Or neighborhood, quite a few did find homes and opportunities in Belleville. Today, however, the specter of gentrification and rising housing costs have forced many migrants out of the neighborhood. Now, one sub area of Belleville that remains stalwartly diverse, uh, a place that I've actually spent quite a bit of my time uh, while there in Paris, is the Place des Fêtes. Uh, which is a massive cluster of social housing tower blocks uh, erected in the 1960s during a particularly vigorous phase of urban renewal. And it's here uh, in the towers, uh, in the plazas, the schools, and the weekly market uh, that people encounter one another across these extraordinary lines of difference. It's here in the Place de Fête that cross-cultural friendships form, romances kindle, bargains are negotiated and deals are struck. Islam, of course, is a common factor for a great many of the residents, but by no means all. Many of the West African and Vietnamese uh, residents are Christian, and in any case, the neighborhood events as many varieties of Islam. And while Belleville youth experience much of the racism, surveillance, and hostility from the police as their counterparts out in the banlieue of Paris, there is not the same sense of spatial isolation or marginalization or enemy uh, in the towers of Place de Fête. Somehow this neighborhood works and a kind of solidarity and diversity is palpable in the streets and the shops. Similarly in the Goutte d'Or, a polyglot mix of people has emerged over the last half century, fueled by sequent migrations. And the Goutte d'Or, or the Drop of Gold, uh, is a neighborhood wedged into the 18th arrondissement between the train tracks of the Gare du Nord and the rising ground of Montmartre. The area was built up in the 18th and 19th centuries around saltpeter production, uh, tanning, and other really noxious industries. And, and these industries attracted workers from Belgium and the Low Countries, as well as from Alsace and other places around Europe. But then beginning in the 1920s and, in, and increasing after World War II, large numbers of immigrants from Morocco, uh, Algeria, and Tunisia began settling the area. So as such, uh, the Goutte d'Or became a hotbed of North African anti-colonial independence activity, uh, which the French state, as you can imagine, met with extensive surveillance, repression, and extrajudicial murder. By the 1980s, the Maghrebi population began to age as younger generations moved to other uh, areas within uh, Paris and even outside of Paris. And as more housing became available outside, a new wave of immigrants began coming into the neighborhood and settling it. So uh, really beginning in the 1970s uh, and picking up in the 1990s and 2000s, large numbers of immigrants came to the Goutte d'Or from Senegal, Sierra Leone, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, and other West African countries. So today the Goutte d'Or comprises one of the most diverse uh, communities in Europe. Uh, but there are worrisome signs, like in Belleville, that gentrification uh, is on the rise. Uh, and unlike previous successions, right, where Algerian and Moroccan families aged out, there is a looming threat of displacement of working class African people uh, by wealthier and younger white Parisians seeking cheaper rents in the city. How this plays out? Uh, remains to be seen, uh, but decades of strong community organization and networks of immigrant solidarity suggest that the Goutte d'Or, as well as Belleville, will not real, uh, yield so readily uh, to these processes of gentrification. So 
this is a little bit of a walk through those neighborhoods, but I want to talk in this just last uh, uh, little bit about what I've learned in the process of making images in these really extraordinary neighborhoods and communities. And I'd like to leave off with a few tentative findings uh, with the caveat that I'm really only in the kind of early stages of this uh, long term project. Um, perhaps the most striking thing I've come to understand is that collectivities are difficult to forge in the cauldron uh, of the global capitalist city, and when they do form, they are precious in their way. Just as often, uh, one gets the sense that even as we dwell together, we dwell apart. While boundary crossing relations do fluoresce into existence, they are usually temporary and contingent, frequent but ephemeral, and fragile. Exceptions exist, of course, but the common experience of diversity remains apartness. This might seem surprising in the context of so-called liberal societies such as France or the United States, but recent political eruptions remind us that liberalism is a thin skin laid atop a roiling mass of illiberal values and beliefs. Uh, hostility against Jews and Muslims in France, or the racist cry of blood and soil uh, in the United States. And while such rhetoric might seem a distant rumbling uh, to many of those of us who live in diverse urban enclaves, it provokes fear and anxiety among residents about their place within national political life. On the other hand, it is increasingly clear that social diversity is almost a precondition for a politics of love and care uh, that moves beyond the boundaries of any one group uh, and allows for the building of solidarity and the bulking of resistance. So the question remains then for me, can cities make a difference, right? Can they provide repositories of values of diversity even while the nations that surround them lapse into xenophobia? Can they provide what sociologist Elijah Anderson calls the cosmopolitan canopy? Can they act as guarantee, guarantors of tolerance in an era where nations govern questions of citizenship and belonging and where racism and bigotry become enshrined in state policy? New York, Paris and Istanbul are cities long shaped by alternating currents of tolerance and bigotry, whether such currents run nationally or locally. But they are also cities at varied moments in their histories um, where diverse interactions among people across lines of difference have shaped a rough sense of tolerance and a shared capacity for getting along in the conduct of everyday life, not without forms of inequality, of course, and not without pain and difficulty and uncertainty and misunderstanding, but a sensibility that can provide a bulwark against the rise of fascism, supported overwhelmingly by people who reside in locations characterized above all by a lack of social diversity. Indeed, it is worth noting that the single greatest predictor of whether someone voted for Donald Trump is not, the, is not first and foremost white racial identity, but dwelling in a white racial enclave. That is white identified and residing in a community where other people are white identified and you're more likely to live next to someone that looks like you. In Jackson Heights and Belleville, as contacts between people multiply over time, diverse groups come to see that despite their varied and often divergent trajectories, they also have common interests. And that by articulating these common interests, they can build local networks, institutions, and political associations. Such associations allow groups to put stakes in the ground and gain some measure of control over the destiny of their communities. But does this translate at scale? How might unities and diversity scale up to the national level, for example? And this raises a basic conundrum, which I'll leave off with, which is, are societies such as the US, France, or Turkey fundamentally liberal cultures where currents of conservatism exist? Or are they fundamentally illiberal cultures with pockets of tolerance and embrasure? In the US, there is a long, if fraught, history of acceptance of hyphenated identities, of conceptions of citizenship articulated between worlds, the Irish American, the African American, the Italian American, and so forth. At the same time, cries for cultural homogeneity erupt continually, 
like some undigested morsel rotting in the guts of the body politic, the deranged exertion of white racial revanchism, the death rattle of the Confederacy, that, that failed state within a state that lies barely submerged under the gloss of American democratic, American democratic institutions and the principal engine of Trump's rise to power. And what of France? To be sure, the French notion of citizenship evinces a brittleness and rigidity that often forecloses hyphenated identities. Subsumed under the skin of Republican citizenship with its premise of a universal subject lurks the profound uh, and durable plaint of Gaullisme and the irreducible embodiment of French identity as white. A Gaullism, as I say, mapped onto white skin and the racial prerogatives of a normative political frame of the white citizen subject. The French state has faltered and stumbled continually in an effort to reconcile these visions, uh, as with the ludicrous efforts to ban burqas on summer beaches. So, in the end, can Paris provide the counterweight to this civic conundrum? Can it outstretch its Frenchness? Can that great city provide safe haven for tolerance of difference in a rapidly changing Europe? What of New York? After all, despite its reputation as an open, tolerant city, it is not only deeply fractious, but racially segregated. Indeed, New York City is one of the most racially segregated cities in the United States. Cosmopolitanism, then, is far from a fixed condition or state of being, but rather a fragile, always incomplete project a world always in the making. It is less an analytic or even descriptive category than a heuristic, a kind of contract or agreement, often tacit, frequently fugitive, always fungible and incohate. There is too, I have to admit, the haunting notion that we might be conjuring the cosmopolitan merely by looking for it, seeing something in these socially diverse urban spaces that simply isn't there finding only a condition of living more apart than together. And this is not only a matter of cosmopolitanism as a category of Western particularism, though that is certainly a concern. It's also a basic question of apophenia. In other words, of our human pro uh, proclivity for seeing patterns even where none exist. But to conclude, uh, I am convinced otherwise. Um, if we deploy the notion of the cosmopolis as a heuristic, we can treat it as particular rather than universal, no more native to New York or Paris than to Istanbul or Abu Dhabi or Jakarta. And we can conceptualize the cosmopolis as a condition of emergence, a set of practices rather than ontologies, an iterative condition formed of routines, habits, feedback, amplification, and mutual recognition. After all, People in diverse communities like Jackson Heights and Belleville have had to craft ways of relating to each other from scratch in the course of their everyday lives. They've had to forge common cause, however fragile, however momentary, just as the price of doing business and getting by in a great metropolis. So what I, I would argue uh, that this cosmopolis welling up from below is precisely what we need to begin fathoming new modes of togetherness weaving threads of solidarity across lines of difference, making way for emergent structures of feeling and bearing witness to injustice. It is through millions of small gestures uh, that these tentative connections, these routine encounters uh, of cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism spark into the world. Once emergent, it is this cosmopolitanism from below that opens up the space for imagination for imagining the possibilities for the next city. And maybe, just maybe, uh, that's enough to keep us hopeful. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for your time uh, and your presentation today, Professor Heathcott. Uh, now, uh, one of our teammates actually uh, posted a, questions, a question on our uh, YouTube live stream. So uh, I want to ask you that. Uh, so you mentioned briefly about your selection of cities as part of this project. 
Could you please elaborate more on where Istanbul fits in this picture of cosmopolitanism and where do you think its potentials uh, and challenges lay on cities being expanding reservoirs of such encounters and diverse experiences? Well, it's a, it's a wonderful question, um, but you know, of course, in many ways, um, it's it, that's it, the answer is really um, it's an answer that all of you have, uh, at least those of you who live in Istanbul have available to you much more than I do, right? Um, in other words, it, it takes that kind of uh, real deep familiarity with a city and a place uh, to begin to understand those rhythms that might emerge uh, as part of this cosmopolitan vision. Um, so uh, I think of Istanbul as, as a city that really was the blueprint of the cosmopolis uh, for the world in many ways. Um, and then it went through a, a, a very uh, difficult, uh, both wonderful and complicated period of nationalism and national development uh, that did unravel many of those kinds of cosmopolitan visions in favor of uh, a kind of solidly Turkish nationalism. Uh, and uh, now Istanbul's sort of emergence in the 1980s, 90s into the 2000s as a, a, a city with highly global aspirations, of course, raises the question again, but obviously uh, it's what is the version of cosmopolitanism that that globalization suggests? Is it a cosmopolitanism of the elite, right? Uh, or is it a cosmopolitanism that is going to well up from below, right? And that to me is a question that it takes a lot of time and, and sort of energy and knowledge to answer that. Uh, but that's kind of, those, 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 that's the kind of entryway into beginning to think about that. Uh, that issue. Does that, does that make sense, Bushra? Uh, uh, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> we have another question, Joseph. Um, thank you so much for the talk. It's wonderful. It's just, I have also some questions and I think I'm, I can be a bit um, manipulating and adding some of my comments to the friends' questions. But um, so first question is about how could you elaborate more on your um, conceptual choice on the cosmopolitanism? Because you very well hinted at uh, the limits of the uh, like political theory, history of political theory of the word, the term, the concept of uh, cosmopolitanism, especially you hinted at its limit, um, its um, ramifications in the um, uh, history of um, Western colonialism and, um, and um, uh, dominance. So the, but I know, and I understand that you use it in an entirely, you kind of um, uh, reframe and you use it in an entirely different, in an entirely um, um, different context and different way and with a different ethical and political agenda. So could you, but, but I still believe, and I know there are many of us um, coming from, um, <laughs> deeply embedded in the discipline of political science uh, might be uh, wondering why and uh, why exactly you choose the concept of cosmopolitanism and how and to what extent it differs from the what kind of possibilities it it offers uh, for example compared to the concept of diversity um, so this is the the second mm -hmm. question and I'll stop here we ha will have a couple of more questions so that's great. No, I, th it's a wonderful question, and uh, I think it's an important one. And what I want to suggest is that, um, first of all, the term diversity is itself, of course, highly problematic, right? And so um, diversity itself uh, is um, sort of the uh, almost the kind of necessary but insufficient condition, right? So that is, what is there beyond diversity uh, that makes for a politics? right, uh, that suggests the politics. Uh, and uh, the term cosmopolitan, of course, uh, clearly has its uh, some intellectual roots, its intellectual roots in this one of Western particularism. Um, 
almost as uh, from from Rousseau's point of view as a, as a, a kind of state of ontology an ontological state a state of being for humans um, and I uh, you know I that's of course an important intellectual tradition but I, I, I somewhat reject it I I ascribe more much more to um, Arjun you know uh, to his uh, view uh, my former boss my former uh, <laughs> uh, uh, provost Arjun Apadurai uh, here at the new school um, uh, that that it despite this sort of uh, the or, the origins of the term in uh, Western uh, particular philosophy that it describes a heuristic environment. It describes a, a real thing that exists in the world, right? Um, and that that real thing that exists in the world bubbles up from all sorts of places. One of the places that it can that can arise from is from the interactions of ordinary people across lines of difference. Uh, that it's not just a matter of these kind of brittle doctrines of of tolerance that emerge out of Lockean Rousseauian categories, but rather Rather, that make do proposition of getting along as the price of doing business in a complex and diverse society. Does that make sense, Mine? And from there, uh, you know, diversity is not enough, right? You can have diversity with no politics, right? But so the question is, how do you get to a politics that allows for not just cross-cultural solidarity, uh, but transnational solidarity? Well, to me, that's the fundamental question is what are, what's the basis of possibility for transnational cross-cultural solidarities uh, uh, in, in, a, in a struggle for social justice in the world? world right thank you so much that's yeah i um i think i i now understand better um but um but i have some other questions uh waiting on the line so i'll keep my um follow-up questions to the end uh Mishra, would you like to continue uh yes of course so joseph i, I have one more question uh for you uh, to what extent and in what ways the widening gap of inequalities and great number of unsettling facts of social injustice unveiled once again by COVID-19 pandemic and climate crisis triggered disasters, challenges, uh, your idea of living together both as, uh, as a social possibilities of democracy and special possibilities of uh, being getting together physically? Yeah, it's it's a wonderful question and, and so apt and timely, right? So um, I've started to think about this idea of living together and living apart as uh, sort of co-equal and co-evil conditions, um, that they're not separate conditions, that we do both at once and, uh, and that different uh, sort of aspects the, the living together and living apart get emphasized in one way or the other, uh, depending on particular kinds of conditions. And the pandemic is a perfect case in point, right? Uh, where, uh, where you know the 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 the, the um, you know the terror of 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 getting COVID, uh, of contracting this disease, uh, pulls us apart from one another, right? Uh, and the question is, um, the question that's much on my mind these days is, what will happen? Uh, when, and I do think there's a when, uh, this uh, you know, recedes, when this pandemic recedes from our lives, uh, you know, are the, the path dependency so strong that we move back into uh, the conditions that, were, that we lived in before, like nothing happened, or have new sort of forms of togetherness and solidarity been created? Um, uh, you know, I think uh, if nothing else, certainly the pandemic in the United States, and, and you, you guys could tell me about if this is the case in Turkey, United States, it has uh, exposed in a very raw kind of way many of the inequalities uh, that exist in our society, uh, even here in New York City, right? The, the kind of um, and highly unequal division of who's able to kind of stay home and work, right? And who has to go out and actually interact with people in, in, and be at, at great risk uh, for contracting the disease. And these are not just the medical professionals, but the people who deliver food, right? The people who deliver uh, food from the groceries and you know people who uh, get your medicine at the pharmacy. And I mean, all these people who have very little choice, uh, but have to work to make a living or else. And, and you know, of course we live in a, in a, in a highly, uh, not just a highly unequal society, a very cruel society. The United States is a very cruel place. Uh, so that if you you can't do that work, if you're if you're menaced by COVID and you can't work, uh, then you're going to not be able to pay your rent and you're going to be evicted, right? And so that's the cruel world we live in. And the, the, so uh, it's exposing the threads of uh, inequality and, and a greater relief in many ways. Uh, so to me, the question will be obviously like what. Uh, you know what are the what are what have we laid down in terms of our our 
uh, or abilities to sort of work together uh, to overcome these inequalities, uh, you know, or are these going to just be further and further exacerbated uh, as we get through this pandemic? Does that make sense, Bushra? I, I, I don't know if I'm, I may be rambling now, so just tell me if I am. <laughs> no, 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 thank you so much for your uh, honest answers. Bisha, I think the next question is also following up on that. So would you like to continue with that as well? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so uh, you repeatedly hinted uh, at in inalienable fluidity, mobility, and vibrant nature of uh, publicity in the cities. So in parallel to this, uh, maybe even in such uh, a countervailing way, uh, there is also great in inclination of withdrawal, indignation, uh, self-enclosedness and isolation, self-segregation segregation among the increasingly vulnerable inhabitants of the city. Uh, given the fact that there uh, is increasingly powerful inclination of, for segregation, how can cities uh, become a site of random uh, and this, this continuous encounters. So other than a set of small self-isolated -iso enclaves. Uh, in other words, um, how can we think of diversity and tolerance between conflicted groups uh, in an extremely polarized political atmosphere, particularly among the urban poor, uh, when social belonging capacities for endurance material substance are severely challenged by austere living the working conditions? Right. Um, well, it, that's... Uh... It's a it's a great question, although it's almost more of a, a kind of complimentary statement than a question, because I I fully agree that these are the conditions that we're, we're working with. Right. Uh, this is the world we're living in. Um, there there's there's a there's a what I mean, it's a wide range of things I could say about that. But, um, you know, one place to start is to uh, it, certainly to think about this in the case of the, of, of the United States, where um, the Interestingly, uh, as the United States grows uh, increasingly unequal as a society, it actually, interestingly, is also growing less segregated. So this uh, uh, seems like a paradox, but it's not. Uh, and that's for several reasons. One, because the United States is simply just becoming more diverse, period. Um, uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that, um, you know, uh, the, the kind of, the, the, public policies that supported uh, the formation of white racial enclaves uh, throughout the 20th century have been largely dismantled. It's not that something has been put in their place to reverse it, but they've been dismantled. And so the neighborhoods and cities that were once super segregated have become less segregated than they were 50 years ago. So that's one thing that's interesting that's happened so that cities, the cities in the United States are becoming more diverse, but you do still have these kind of, ra uh, kind of white racial enclaves that are the kind of basis uh, of support for you know, racist and xenophobic policies of Trump and the Republican party and so forth, right? So that's just, that's one uh, way to, uh, to think about it. The other is um, that, uh, that the inequality, um, diversity and inequality are, are often, you know, they're, they're, they're co-evil conditions. They, they emerge together. They're not the same thing, right? They, they're they're uh, diversity, uh, diverse, pe diverse groups sort of come into societies uh, in which inequality is in formation all the time, right? Uh, and so different groups come into societies at different moments in their, their own kind of histories of inequality. So it's a very complex and uneven set of histories. Uh, and we do live in a, in, in a world in which many cities around the globe are increasingly um, unequal, right? I mean, the, the inequality is growing and growing and growing. We also live in a world in which many cities are growing increasingly diverse because of the footloose uh, nature of capital and labor, right? That's just uh, what's happening in the world. The, the, the the, the question is open, like the, the, we don't know what's going to happen with this, right? We're, in, we're living in that right now. So we don't exactly know what that's going to mean. What does it mean that Johannesburg, for example, is growing much more unequal as a city and also staggeringly diverse uh, as a city? 
right? Especially with uh, Im immigrants from all over Sub-Saharan Africa, from North Africa, and from other places coming into the city, right? Uh, and mixing with people uh, there. Uh, growing inequality, but also tremendous social diversity, just as the questioner is saying, also large high levels of antagonism between groups, right? Uh, and so, the, so it's an open question as to what transpires on the ground. What will people do as part of the ordinary business of getting by? This, of course, is a great deal uh, uh, to a great extent. What uh, Abdul Malik's work is about, right? Uh, is what are those kind of threads of of, of getting along, right? Uh, from day to day in these places. I know I'm not answering your question, but I'm just reflecting on on what is a good question. <laughs> no, it's uh, very well. Thank you so much. So we have one more questions, actually. I think this is our last question. Um, Sorry if I went over. I hope I didn't take no, too much no, no, time. No, 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 Joseph, that's perfect. It just um, we are just. Um, uh, we are just having so much fun uh, and like having been receiving wide range of questions, but this one is also um, has just uh, popped up in my mind, but one of our, someone from our audience, actually a friend also, a colleague also framed it very well. So your talk had also given us um, very powerful insights and uh, fresh lenses to rethink about the new, like the practices and theories of new materialism and limits of virtuality, especially as a way of, as a tool for um, urban planners and like for um, the theories, theories of vernacular architecture and the urban designers, um, especially your emphasis on like corporeality, corporeality and like bodily encounters just vividly spark out of your photographs and your narrative in general, your narrative. So a comment and a question uh, from, uh, from our, one of our colleagues, um, she says, geographers have paid attention to the ways in which digital technologies are allowing popular and activist engagements with urban maps. They're interested in the ways that online maps can be used as a means of for enabling and organizing different forms of place representation by allowing photographs to be added to the specific locations, for example. Do you think photography and mapping works together uh, to define landscapes of the commons? So to what extent these like new forms, new um, practices of representation uh, for rethinking the commons, the commoners, the encounters of the commoners kind of uh, speak to your work or how could you elaborate more on that? I don't know if I... Yeah. It's a wonderful question. Yeah. So, I, you know, as, as I, I'm sure your colleague probably has is better handle on this than I do, but, um, you know, my, my uh, first reaction to this is always that um, the, the digital universe that we live in cuts in multiple ways. And there's no one way that it's ever going to, uh, you know, promote togetherness or promote enemy, right? That they're, they're, these are kind of spaces of strategy and tactics, right? Uh, to, to draw on Bourdieu and others that, um, you know, so for example, uh, a, a thing like Twitter can be uh, absolutely central to, uh, to making the Arab Spring happen, right? Uh, it can promote uh, communications uh, for uh, protests uh, that are towards justice, right? Uh, critical cartography, I'm a huge uh, uh, you know, proponent of critical cartography uh, as a way to uh, sort of speak towards uh, the, the sort of organization of the map uh, by, uh, by fields of power and power relationships. At the same time, uh, you know, digital modalities of, of mapping and cartography are also uh, ways of um, stabilizing uh, power or uh, revealing the vulnerabilities of people on the ground, right? Uh, I think of uh, a project that, you know, years ago, I, I was doing a, a studio review at a We'll, we'll just say a, an architecture school that shall remain nameless in the Northeast of the United States. Uh, and the students were very proud that they had, um, they had mapped Dharavi, right? The Dharavi uh, slum in India. And, I, and I, my first reaction was, uh, that's a terrible idea. Like uh, who, who is gonna have this map, right? Who, who gets this map? Like part of the, part of the, 
the importance of that community is its eligibility to people from the outside, right? Uh, in, in so many ways, that's what saves it from a, a great deal of, of repression, however much inequality, uh, you know, uh, and, sp and sp spatial marginalization runs through this interstitial location in Mumbai. Uh, but, you know, you're going to then reveal it to the world? Like, what, what is that, right? That's a, that, that, like, so it's, it's, it's a question of tactics and strategies about revealing and concealing that I think are the most important questions to ask in any instance where you're talking about uh, digital tools and, and, and mapping and, uh, and things like that. Does, that. does that even begin to make sense? Um, yeah. Oh, I, don't, I don't know. I'd love to have that long conversation with you and your colleagues, actually, because I, I work with maps a lot, as you know. So it's a question that's sort of constantly on my mind. Um, yes. What am I doing by mapping something, right? Yes, we have, uh, we work as a team of like, uh, as a, like a mixed team of um, urban planners, designer, political scientists, and like environmental engineers. So I think uh, it will be like a day long conversation with you. We will be very happy. We have to stop here uh, at this point, but we will be very happy to have you first physically uh, in Istanbul back again, or to have to continue this conversation. We are very much thankful. We, much, we are very much appreciating your time and your sharing um, your work with us, Joseph, tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and our audience is just like uh, waving hands and like friends waving hands. So we are very, <laughs> uh, we are very grateful and um, hope everyone um, is just um, Joseph, uh, Professor Heathcote, though his classes start tomorrow and he has a very busy schedule. He has lots of like students and, and like uh, researchers, uh, studio people around him, uh, including myself. He's very open and accessible and uh, like supportive scholar. So uh, he currently teaches at the new school and uh, you may very well find uh, his contact. Uh, we are very much looking forward to have this conversation further uh, to, uh, I know you have been also working uh, on uh, the like water politics, like politics of water. And like, we are very much concerned about this, like building of the project Canal Istanbul. And it's, it's very like on top of the water crisis, climate crisis, we have this crisis of the canal. So- uh, no, no comment on the canal. <laughs> 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 yeah, we leave it to the like uh, another off the record conversation, but we are very much <laughs> looking forward to have it. Thank you so much, Joseph. We will be having, uh, and thanks for everyone uh, for being with us tonight. We will be having a very, um, you will be seeing after this conversa conversation, and you'll be seeing a very short um, five seconds image that will end the live streaming on YouTube. Uh, so that will be before that we want to say goodbye and thank you so much once again. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks bye -bye. everybody. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye bye.